So welcome and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Caleb Lovell, and I'm the Program Manager for the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable. I'm so pleased to be able to help moderate uh, this session this afternoon. Thank you all for joining. Uh, we've had a lot of interest in this topic, and we greatly appreciate your time, and we truly hope you find this guide as valuable as we do. To, su to successfully reach 80% nationally, we know how much of the, that work must be coordinated and inspired from the state and local level. We also know that many of you on this webinar have taken up the 80% call, championing the efforts within your state or locality. We are uh, also excited for those here today just getting started on building your own colorectal cancer coalitions, as those efforts will help us keep the momentum going nationwide as we continue to strive for 80% in 2018 and beyond. The purpose of today's call, uh, is, or today's webinar, is to unveil the new guide to the development of state-level colorectal cancer coalitions as well as this action-oriented summary report and workbook. We'll start by taking a look at the 10 tasks in which, help, uh, in which, help, which has helped coalitions begin, maintain, and grow their efforts. We will then hear uh, from the experiences and lessons learned from two states, Kentucky and California. These two states were some of the earliest leaders in establishing successful state-level colorectal cancer coalitions, and their expertise was instrumental uh, in, in the development of these resources. Uh, before diving in too far, I wanted to show a quick screen grab of the NCCRT Resource Center so you all know how to get your copy of the guide and workbook, which is now available. Hopefully everyone is familiar with the new look of the NCC, nccrt.org website and is finding our interactive resource center helpful to their work. You can navigate to the Resource Center from the NCCRT page by finding it listed in the main navigation menu at the top of our site. Once in the Resource Center, you can find a number of evidence-based innovations and tools uh, to increase colorectal cancer screening in a range of settings and populations. Filters are, filters are available to search by setting, target audience, uh, intervention type, and more, which makes it easy to find tailored uh, tools to uh, working with specific populations. You can also use the search bar if you know the name of a particular resource or a topic that you'd like to learn more about. Finally, finally, users can also submit their own resources. So it's truly a one-stop uh, shop to find valuable tools to help uh, you with your work. And I encourage you all to check it out uh, uh, and visit it often. During the webinar, we will hear from uh, Katie Bassey, a program director of the Kentucky Cancer Consortium, and Shante Davis, program director of the Comprehensive Cancer Control Program at the California Department of Public Health. Unfortunately, before we get to their excellent presentations, uh, you still have to hear from me a little bit more. Um, so I'd like to share a few housekeeping items before we get started. We are recording today's webinar. The replay and speaker slides will be shared with you all within a few days. Please feel free to share with your colleagues uh, that were not able to join us today. Also, because of the large number of participants, all participants are muted on today's webinar. Having said that, we still want uh, to make sure you get what you need from the webinar, so uh, we encourage you to, uh, to ask questions by submitting them through the webinar Q&A function. Uh, we will have time for questions after the presentation, and we'll answer as many uh, as we can. And we'll also be emailing around responses to any questions we don't have time to get to. You can also email us specific questions afterward. And finally, we are always trying to improve our webinars, so we are asking for your help evaluating this webinar. You'll be receiving an email with a survey link. Uh, please help us out with this by taking a few minutes to provide feedback. We take this advice very seriously and uh, we are always trying to improve. So with all that said, I will start by sharing a bit more about uh, the new guide. So what we know is that more and more states are starting colorectal cancer focus, uh, uh, colorectal cancer focus coalitions uh, and working groups and have been asking about best practices and lessons learned. They've also been asking what we can learn from other states. We also know that 33 states have participated in colorectal cancer technical assist assistance workshops and benefited from uh, being able to talk about coalition building and even more took time during these technical assistance workshops to share and learn, um, and learn from other states. So we've been working on a new guide on the development of state level colorectal cancer coalitions. The guide provides partners with a framework for the development of state-based coalitions uh, focused on colorectal cancer control. This guide highlights lessons learned from five states that have uh, effective, uh, well-established collaborations and focus on increasing colorectal cancer screening rates. 
The states highlighted were chosen in consultation with members of the Comprehensive Cancer Control nat uh, National Partners. While other high-performing states uh, could have also been highlighted, these five were chosen because they offer a range of models, funding levels, and diverse approaches. As you can see here, states include California, Delaware, Kentucky, Minnesota, and South Carolina. That said, I'm always interested in uh, learning about what other states are up to, so please feel free to email me and share what's going on uh, in your state and how we can help. The Companion Workbook provides partners with an abbreviated yet action-oriented outline for the development of state-based coalitions focused on uh, colorectal cancer control. This executive summary and workbook complements the expansive findings uh, of our full guide by providing brainstorming prompts, checklists, and frameworks to help prepare you for your upcoming coalition work and project. And here you can see uh, an example of, of what a summary page will look like. I really like it because it's just a, this two-page kind of brief, uh, uh, two-page spread and brief summary. And we have this for each task. And then each task also has uh, what you can see here, this action-oriented layout, uh, which includes exercises to get you thinking about conversation and uh, conversations and preparation steps. So we hope you, uh, we hope that these will help you think through priority actions, but also that you can use these materials to specifically call on partners and ask for their engagement. And here you can see uh, the 10 tasks that are all uh, um, uh, tackled within the, uh, within the new guide and what I'll be going over in a little bit more depth during this uh, webinar. So first, uh, what we know uh, whenever we're prior prioritizing colorectal cancer in our state uh, is that colorectal cancer is one of the few cancers that can be prevented, and we know that colorectal cancer screening works and saves lives. Another, sell, uh, another selling point for focusing on colorectal cancer is the national support offered and the ability to tap into uh, national colorectal cancer roundtable tools and models, but also resources from CDC, the Comprehensive Cancer Control National Partnership, Prevent Cancer Foundation, and many others. I'd also encourage you to look at examples on our website for the 80% Hall of Famers, those national, state, and local organizations boasting at least an 80% screening rate. Finally, the guide provides tools uh, that will help you use screen uh, rate data to make your case. The webinar links on this slide uh, will further help you understand colorectal cancer screening data and offer tips on that data to use and how to find it. Also, it is worth mentioning that uh, it can help to share data on the consequences of not addressing the problem, so um, focusing on the treatment cost within a particular state or, uh, or a local level. And here, this is just a, a nice uh, example fact sheet, I think, from Kentucky, and I don't want to steal any Katie's thunder, but um, I, do like, I do think it's worth showing here. Um, and, and the one thing that I'll have you focus here on this particular slide is, so think about your audience as you're putting together these data, uh, these priorities in this data and these fact sheets, and how different folks might need different types of data or fact sheets made available to them. There are two types of coalition structures outlined in the guide. Uh, first, a model that is within the state comprehensive cancer control program infrastructure, and second, an independent nonprofit organization model. Certainly, there are benefits and disadvantages to each, and the workbook um, has some activities that will help you think through uh, the best uh, think through the best model for you and your partners. Here we start uh, looking into our third task, which is developing a vision. And we consider the vision here a little bit different than the mission. So when getting people inspired and behind a coalition, I think uh, you are best to start uh, with asking, in what world does a coalition like this not need to exist? Um, and the guide offers tips and advice in developing a vision and mission from, um, you know, examples from the CDC and the National Co uh, Comprehensive Cancer Con uh, Control Partnership uh, our, our, the National Comprehensive Cancer Control Program, but I do find that the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable here provides uh, an interesting case example. So here you can see kind of the vision from the roundtable, which, uh, you know, in our, in our ideal world where we wouldn't exist uh, is where uh, there is um, an elimination of colorectal cancer as a major public health problem. And what I also think is nice that the roundtable is kind of laid out is, um, some, some really specific uh, ideas about what our role is and how we don't conflict with our partners. 
Um, so leveraging all of our members, um, simulating collaboration on projects, and, and for, uh, a forum for communication developing consensus. So our fourth task is recruiting leadership and staff. Uh, and, and early on, a highly respected champion is key. The champion can help legitimize the effort and utilize his or her social capital to get broader engagement and support for the coalition. Not to mention that this person probably helps set the vision for the organization and provide long-term intellectual leadership. Um, second on there is uh, what myself and our other presenters on the phone take on, which is more of the project manager role. Uh, so I think we can all just acknowledge today that the responsibility of these staffers is really to do all the legwork and all the hard work of the coalition. Um, uh, but then, uh, and then the final two on there are the steering committee and the task group members and chairs. And what I'll suggest, my recommendation for these particular, um, you know, for these particular roles within the, the coalition is, you know, to aim high and look for folks who understand coalition work, but also want to see work completed. Uh, the guide here uh, on as, as far as the task of building a network of partners, the guide offers assistance in develop, developing a priority list of individuals critical to these efforts. You know, too often I think we imagine including non-traditional partners uh, within our, we, we're, we're good at reaching out to the traditional partners and we always think that we need to include the non-traditional partners. So the traditional partners here as the example is the State Department of Health, the American Cancer Society. Uh, but a lot of times we think we want to uh, also invite these non-traditional partners uh, but we don't follow up on the work needed to get them involved. And so what I'd encourage you here is to think about how best they can help the cause and really commit to making that happen. Uh, and this is actually something, you know, how do we provide, you know, how do we get more policymakers or more um, media or more marketing folks or fundraising folks? This is something that, you know, we, we deal with on the national level as well. So um, I think, you know, part of that is really committing, committing to that particular, those particular folks and, and getting them a part and at the table. Uh, you can see here that the guide provides steps and advice on how to convene partners, uh, which perhaps many of you have expertise on. But what I, I like about the guide here, the, the guide also provides practical examples of meeting agendas and minutes. Um, and, the, and, and what's really nice about that is the guide provides examples uh, that always have an eye towards follow-up and project implementation. So which I think is critical for turning a good meeting into a great meeting. Uh, here we uh, are probably, with setting goals and objectives, we're, we're probably have another area where you all have quite a bit of, of practice. Uh, but the guide has some really, uh, some really nice and unique tools to offer help and assistance um, in working on these objectives and these goals in a collaborative, in a collaborative, a collaborative way. The two things I'll really point out here on this slide is to one, brainstorm often to create a sense of urgency and activity amongst the group. But find decision, but, but find decision making time as well to prioritize the truly high impact and feasible activities. Uh, and the second thing is plan um, some early wins to help maintain and build momentum. So what I like to think of these as our kind of three month wins, our six month wins, our 12 month wins. So if we can get to the three month wins, we can kind of get people's buy-in to the six month wins. And if we get to the six month wins, then we can keep people's buy-in for the 12 month wins. Um, and we get, and we can kind of uh, build momentum and, and gain trust in that manner. Uh, and then speaking about building momentum, we, we've talked a lot about how to maintain this momentum already, but uh, what important aspect of this slide, one important aspect of this slide is to communicate project, uh, project's progress uh, often and through a variety of different channels. So not just your formal organizational reports or your documents, but really looking at other ways um, of communication through newsletters, email blasts, social media. And within the toolkit, you'll, you'll see a lot of examples from Minnesota and Kentucky and others um, where they're, um, kind of finding creative ways to, to use their marketing skills and, and to make sure that people know the progress being made um, and want to be a part of that progress. This task, uh, the getting creative with funding and resources, this task I think we all find to be maybe the hardest but most desirable task. Uh, fundraising is, is a special skill. Uh, the guide provides some really unique fundraising suggestions and opportunities um, and if that's a path that you, you want to try to tackle and want to take on. But it also looks at some of the ways to best leverage in-kind support. Not only that, um, you know, not only that, but the best examples are highlighted uh, where 
big strides uh, were made with truly little to no funding. And then finally, uh, we have uh, this task of making sure that we hold the group accountable. And on the issue of accountability, we do well to set our goals and hold people to, to task for their commitments. But what seems to work best in coalition work is offering a carrot instead of a stick. So to make sure we truly celebrate our wins and successes. And I, and I just have one example from the guide uh, that I particularly like here from uh, Delaware, which kind of shows what they said that they were going to accomplish within a particular year and then has this little stamp of done, 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 uh, and then at the, at the bottom there, uh, you know, to be accomplished. So it gives that sense of things that we're able, we were able to do, things that we did together, and then uh, things that we're looking uh, to accomplish and still need to do. So really trying to celebrate success as much as possible. Um, finally, you know, another great aspect of, of coalition work is all the, all the collaboration that needs to go in behind the scenes. So uh, this, this particular uh, slide here shows just how many people it took to put the resource like this together in a toolkit, um, in a toolkit format, and uh, we, we just appreciate the efforts of all of them. And uh, with that, I will pass on the baton to our next presenter. Great. Thanks so much, Caleb. Well, it is an honor to be on the call with you all today. My name is Katie Beachy, and I work with the Kentucky Cancer Consortium in the great state of Kentucky. Kentucky is a buzz right now with the Derby coming up on Saturday, so forgive some of the, um, the analogies I might make with you all. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the Kentucky story. I have a story to tell you. And like the Derby, everybody loves someone who is a long shot. And for the colon cancer subculture, Kentucky has definitely been a long shot in the past 20 years. As you can see, when we um, started to collectively meet, uh, we were 49th in the nation. Can't get too much worse than that. And we've come a long way. You'll see our incidence rate has gone down. Our screening rate has gone up to just over 70% and we're now 17th in the nation. And this little excerpt I picked out for you is actually from the snapshot that Caleb shared earlier. And we tried to focus on the positive with this. We found that maybe too often we were focusing on how far we had to go as, a far, as opposed to how far we'd come. And so we picked out some data, and I won't go through it here. You can see it clearly on the screen to let people know, you know what, we have done a lot of work over the past 15 years, 17 years, and we've come a long way. And this really seemed to resonate with our partners. In fact, we just finished a, a thank you campaign where we thanked providers um, on how much they've done. So the odds were against us starting out. And so the story that I have to tell you today is how did we do it? And I'm going to tell it through a little bit of a different lens. Um, as Caleb mentioned, we were helpful in making this workbook that he has just explained to you. So I'm going to tell you some of those tasks that he mentioned that we implemented as a coalition over the past 15 years that we found really helpful. So <clears throat> I won't belabor the point. He mentioned what the 10 tasks were. And I'll start with um, kind of the 30,000 foot view and I'll come down to a little closer. So as Caleb mentioned, we really felt like task five, building a network of partners was where we needed to start. And so we had the people listed here at the table, the health department, comp cancer, nonprofits. We spent a lot of time trying to nurture those relationships to get everybody at the table for what we started out with was a statewide summit. That was our incentive to get people to the table to begin with and to begin the dialogue. And I will tell you that um, it took a lot of meetings to even get that first summit off the ground back in 2000, gosh, 2007, 2008. But we've built on it ever since then. That was really a catalyst for us. And it didn't take a whole lot of money, but it did take a whole lot of time and collaboration. But it really set us on good footing to find some work groups to move forward on. Also from that summit emerged some champions, you know, the people who got up to ask questions, the people that came up and said, hey, if you, if you ever do something like this again, let me know. Champions rose to the top, and we really tried to cultivate those relationships and find leaders. And I will tell you, it was extremely helpful to have um, a physician who was a champion. We happened to have a gastroenterologist as well as a primary care physician who came to the forefront, and someone in public health who was, um, for lack of a better term, higher up the food chain in the Department for Public Health and could really help make decisions and guide some of the programs, uh, the middle management that, that we were working on. And so that public health um, champion was really key as well. 
And then um, we coordinated our efforts through lots of interventions, which I'll give you a couple examples, and found that our sweet spot here in Kentucky for change was going to be policy change. So let me tell you um, a little bit about how we cultivated those partnerships. First of all, and I, I alluded to some of the tasks here that were from the workbook that you now have to guide you, but how we did it in Kentucky for that task four of recruiting leadership and staff, to be honest, we just needed to step up to the plate ourselves and say, you know what, I work for the Comprehensive Cancer Control Program. While that's not just colon cancer, uh, colon cancer was a huge issue in our state, and I'm going to pony up my time to be the person to bring these folks together, to do the agendas, to make the phone calls, to reserve the space, kind of that legwork that isn't necessarily too um, <laughs> exciting, but you need somebody who's willing to take that on. For us in Kentucky, that was comp cancer staff. And we established our structure by that first summit, um, getting together and trying to figure out what what needs to happen in the structure. What do we need subcommittees? Do we do we have enough momentum for subcommittees? Are we all on the same page with where we see our goals as being? So we worked really hard in those early years to try to very clearly define our roles. Because I'll tell you, we knew we had policy work to be done, but a good three quarters of the people at our table were not able to directly lobby. So, including myself. So we really needed to find those champions like the ACS CAN um, staff in our state and um, the physicians who were willing to go testify to be able to identify their role as advocates. So we did make policy a strong priority. And part of defining um, the key partners at that table, as you can see in that third paragraph down, for us was a 501c3 that ended up hiring a lobbyist part-time, very part-time. We've gotten a lot more out of him than they pay him for. But um, that was a game changer. I'll explain a little bit about that later on. But again, it was it, it's identifying the roles of the people that you're trying to convene and maximizing what they can do well. And then just meet, meet, meet. You know as well as I do. Um, there's a book called Death by Meeting <laughs> that I think I've lived through many times. And so we really tried to make meetings that were action-oriented, that people felt rejuvenated when they left. We fed them well. We convened them around that summit initially, and then we picked some projects that we felt like, as um, Caleb mentioned, could be wins, three, six, 12 months, and we got to work. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. So we started with our foundation of partnerships. Once you get those partners together, boy, we really depended on our registry here in Kentucky. If you don't have a working relationship with your state cancer registry, um, over Hill, over Dale, uh, head to their office after this phone call and try to, try to forge one. They really were key in presenting the data in a way to our partners that could say, colon cancer is a problem in this state. Here specifically are where the problems lie, these areas of the state. Here's the demographic, even more specific. Um, that you need to look at. So we took the registry data. We talked to our state BRFIS, um, Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System Program folks. And we got that data and kind of laid it out with who's doing what. Is there somebody who's already like distributing flyers about you should be screened? And is somebody already paying for those, you know, PSAs from CDC? And what is everybody doing? Um, so we decided that, well, we have the data, we have, we know where our opportunities lie. Now we better have a plan because what if? <laughs> and that second bullet you can see was our creative, um, the task about being creative with funding. We got creative in the sense that we made a resource plan that actually put dollar signs next to our plan. So instead of saying, you know, we want to increase colon cancer screening by 5% in the next five years. We thought, well, what would it cost to make that happen? How many FIT tests would it cost? And how much do FIT tests cost? Would we, uh, colonoscopies, how many would it take to do colonoscopies? And how much would that cost? We put actual dollar signs with it and just hoped that um, our continued work would acquire resources. And if it did, we would have a plan. So with that resource plan, we um, kept meeting and kept meeting, and then 
some things you can plan for and some things you can't plan for. And uh, one of the things that happened was we had some folks in Kentucky who were um, passionate and were willing to testify at the state health and welfare committee meeting. We planned for that. Um, we made the case that CRC screening was going to save lives and it was going to save money. And we found legislature, legislators who were survivors and who were physicians and were willing to go to, to, to bat for us. What you can't plan is for things like um, a gastroenterologist who's got a lot of gumption um, and a lot of passion pairing up with a cancer survivor who used to be a fundraiser and finding our plan online and saying, you know what, they've got a plan, but they don't have money. How can we help them? You can't, you can't plan for that. But we were so blessed to have them become um, a huge part of us moving forward and finding a 501c3 that was called the Kentucky Cancer Foundation and said we're willing to go to the legislature and try to, to raise some money for this. And here's, I just wanted to give you a snapshot of the, the kind of thing that they were trying to sell. We had numbers. We said, well, if you invest $100,000 in cancer prevention and screening, here are the kind of things you might see as a result. If you don't, um, you're going to end up paying for treatment in these different areas, and here's where that same $100,000 would take you. So we had a plan, we had dollar signs, we had um, passionate people who were willing uh, to go and tell our legislators about this. And as I mentioned, our sweet spot was that task number seven of goals of policy change. We had folks like the Colon Cancer Prevention Project, which was that um, gastroenterologist with gumption I mentioned, and we had the Kentucky Cancer um, Action Network that's through the um, American Cancer Society. They paired up and um, worked really hard to get this measure, measure to legislators. And again, this is something we developed to let legislators know we see what you're doing and we appreciate it, and here's where the next steps might lie. And I won't go through these one by one, but I will tell you that each one of these things had behind it a lot of meetings um, on a lot of rainy days with um, stale coffee occasionally, and but with really passionate people because we had the right people at the table, we were able to maintain this coalition through years and years of hard work. Our original summit that I mentioned back in the um, you know early 2000s, we had come out of that with three committees, public awareness, provider education, and policy. And as you can see from this slide, lots of things happened in those three subgroups as a result of our, our early planning. <clears throat> Just to give you um, uh, something to do with the maintaining momentum, you really do need to identify for your coalition what some um, early wins might be that you could collaborate on. Collaboration is hard. Something as easy, seemingly easy as whose logos do we put on that poster can really become something that butts heads. And so we had to work hard to get some of these things done. We put together a public awareness campaign that several different organizations were able to contribute to. That campaign is being redeveloped right now to be re resold and redone um, with a new wave of providers. And we really had to um, pay attention to what was our health department able to do and what were they not able to do and to come alongside them in our colon cancer screening program here in Kentucky and say, you know, they are able to do this really well, which was training patient navigators in their local screening programs, but they couldn't advocate, of course, as being state government workers. So that the C2P2 that's mentioned there on the screen, that's our colon cancer um, prevention project that here in Kentucky has really taken the lead on advocacy when it comes to advocacy in Kentucky. Another thing that we've done here in Kentucky for our coalition is we have worked really hard to get inflatable colons all over the state. We've got seven now that travel around doing a lot of public awareness and bringing a lot of, of press to the colon in Kentucky. And then we have nonprofit partners um, like the Kentucky Cancer Link that is able to do the kind of hand holding with our patients that really gets them from a fit in their hand to a fit completed at their doctor's office and um, scheduled for the next year. So we had partners, um, we focused on policy, but we also put a lot of effort into provider education and public awareness. And 
again, I really think it's helpful to focus on where you've come as opposed to how much farther you have. Here's just a quick example. We did some regional um, data collection through our um, awesome Kentucky Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System staff here in Kentucky. And look at what we found. We were able to say that one of our um, districts here in Kentucky had reached 80 by 18. And several, while they might not look like they have really high screening rates, had made uh, over 30% increase in their screening rates in the past 10 years. And to be honest, that's almost to be more celebrated in some ways, because think of how far they had to come to go from 30% screening rate to 63%. It's just, it's really encouraging. And so this was part of our thank you campaign where we um, really tried to highlight this is what you've done well. Another task that's on the table as part of your coalition work will be to hold the, the group accountable, uh, that last task 10, and try to uh, figure out what your next steps are. We have a lot more to do in Kentucky. We have a, an issue with blacks having a higher incidence rate and mortality rate from colon cancer than whites. A lot of people are still getting diagnosed at a late stage, and our Appalachian region is really uh, still in need of some attention. Um, but I will tell you that it is a roller coaster ride that we have committed to be on board with one another as a coalition. I'm from Pittsburgh. This is the Thunderbolt. It's a wooden roller coaster that will rattle your teeth and lots of ups and downs, and we have certainly seen that. I just shared with uh, Mary Dorshank before the call started that we're excited to report here in Kentucky that while we lost funding for our Kentucky Colon Cancer Screening Program uh, recently in the past few years, it was just uh, put back into the budget in this new biennium. And so it, it's been a roller coaster ride the past few years. We've had a lot of ups and downs as a coalition, but because we were hard, we committed to meeting and talking and trying to find common ground, um, it served us extremely well. I wish that 15 years ago I had had this uh, workbook to guide our efforts here in Kentucky, but I'm, I'm proud that we can share with you some of the successes we've had in implementing these tasks, not knowing what we were doing at the time. And I want to give a shout out to my partners here in Kentucky that are, these are the faithful folks that show up every, every meeting and um, bring to the table what they can to work as a collective and make something happen. And it's really been an honor for the camp, Comp Cancer Program in Kentucky to host these folks in the Colon Cancer Committee. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Shantae. There you go, Shantae. Great. Thank you, Katie. I um, mean, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm honored uh, to be able to um, come and present to you all today on our um, efforts in California with our Colorectal Cancer Coalition. Okay, so um, I am the program director for California's Comprehensive Cancer Control Program, and our Comp Cancer Program, as we call it, um, is sort of the foundation of um, how all of our efforts got started here in California. So just a quick slide on um, just the basic program structure. We are charged with establishing um, a cancer coalition, and our cancer coalition is called the California Dialogue on Cancer, or CDOC, as we call it. Um, and we assess the burden of cancer, um, and we're also responsible for developing and implementing a comprehensive cancer control plan for California. So in regards to our efforts for um, colorectal cancer, um, you know, it first started with our first uh, cancer plan. And so, and this actually goes back to um, task one in the workbook. Um, our first plan was adopted back in 2004, and it included goals and objectives to reduce the overall cancer burden um, by um, 2010. Um, and for um, colorectal cancer, um, reducing mortality was prioritized. And at the time, um, we had a lofty goal um, to reduce the colorectal cancer mortality in California by 40%. So the way our uh, CDOC is structured, our Cancer Coalition is structured, we had implementation teams, we called them at the time, to work on various issues. And so we knew it was important at that time to form an implementation, implementation team for colorectal cancer. And part of the work of that um, implementation team was um, going through and figuring out, you know, exactly what should be done about colorectal cancer um, in California. So um, 
they started to plan. And as Katie said, you know, there's a lot of meetings that are involved. So um, in sort of planning on what, to, you know, what were the next steps in moving forward, um, they started to organize um, a, a dialogue for action. So um, at the time, uh, the implementation team applied for funding um, to further the screening um, efforts that they had identified in our um, cancer plan. And our um, convening was uh, funded by the Prevent Cancer Foundation um, at the time. And as you all know about the dialogue for actions that um, occur um, nationwide with uh, Prevent Cancer Foundation. So um, we received a grant back um, in 2006 to actually convene our dialogue for action um, in California. And it was all around um, colorectal cancer. So the outcome of that uh, particular convening was that um, $60,000 was raised to assist in establishing a 501c3 to work specifically on um, those um, objectives that they had identified um, within the implementation team. And in 2007, uh, the California Colorectal Cancer Coalition, or as we call it here in California, C4, was established. And I will say that, um, you know, we had a, a major champion, um, one um, champion in particular that kind of um, rose to the top in helping to um, move things forward. But, you know, we're very, very lucky in California that we have several champions. So, um, you know, working in comp cancer, you know, I work on different cancer um, issues besides colorectal cancer. Um, and it's hard to get that champion um, to be the one who's going to be there and passionate and driving efforts. But again, um, here in California, we have several um, individuals who um, are champions for uh, colorectal cancer here. So, so we're very lucky in that. Um, and then the mission of C4 is to save lives and reduce suffering from colorectal cancer in all Californians. And you can see um, the website here um, for C4. So basically the, um, you know, the effort started as an implementation team of our comp cancer program. Um, and as you'll see in the guide, you know, that is one of the avenues to take um, that you can take in establishing your coalition. And it really um, did prove to be very effective here in California. Um, you're pulling the, um, all of the, the different uh, stakeholders that are a part of the coalition that have an interest um, in this, and then you do your further outreach in um, convening more um, folks who um, are going to help with the effort. And so here's just a, a picture of C4, and this is not all of the folks that are a part of the C4 board, um, but some of them. Um, C4 is led by a president and a volunteer member board. And I want to say that, you know, I again, I work with a lot of cancer groups, and C4 has been one of the groups um, that has done, I will say, the most with no paid staff. Um, again, they're all volunteer-led. Um, I'm actually an ex-officio on their board, and every meeting they are getting things done. And you and and a lot of the members of uh, C C4 are gastroenterologists, um, physicians. So they're busy folks that have a lot of things to do, but the one key thing that they all have in common is they have this shared passion for reducing colorectal cancer mortality, and more specifically in California, increasing um, the, the screening rate here in California. So some of the major funders um, for C4 are the Colon Cancer Alliance through the Undy Run Walks. Um, and they occur in Sacramento um, and San Diego, um, at least those that um, contribute to these efforts, um, as well as ACS. And I will say, too, that um, all of the board members on C4 do work very hard um, to ensure that um, the uh, organization is funded. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what um, is funded because it's not staff. So, um, they also are uh, work in close coordination with the American Cancer Society. Um, they're still a part of our coalition CDOC. Um, and also, we do have a state um, CDC-funded um, 
colorectal cancer screening program. So we all work in collaboration on these efforts. But again, C4 is really that driving force because we really have those champions out front um, really moving things um, to the next level. So one of the major programs of C4 um, is a community grants program. They have an annual community collaborative grant process um, that was initiated in 2013 and their major focus for this program is to increase the screening rate in California FQHCs. Um, and this program has been amazing and I've been um, very lucky to be a part of, um, you know, reviewing um, some of the grants. And this process happens every year um, in the fall, usually around October um, the RFA um, is released. And so you'll see here that since 2013, through um, this year, a total of almost $400,000 has funded 55 grants. And so these are small grants that go to FQHCs, and not all of the grants um, go specifically to FQHCs. They have funded some survivorship projects, some prevention, um, some other type of prevention projects, but really the, the, the most of the funds are going directly to FQHCs to support their efforts. And then, um, you know, we continue that collaboration. So that, um, you know, initial collaboration with the Comp Cancer Program and the State Cancer Coalition, CDOC, continues. We continue um, to coll collaborate on various um, efforts. Um, there's, uh, I'm, I'm gonna talk about um, one of them that we've done in the past year. Um, and it helps that C4 does have an independent status um, that allows them to do more um, because we are um, housed under um, our state health department. Um, C4 having that um, independence does allow them to, um, to again, to, to do more um, within their organization. Um, and then our uh, broad stakeholder um, reach allows the engagement of additional partners to address CRC efforts. So it's still this you know, continuous collaboration that happens between all of these organizations. Um, and just to, I'm gonna go a little quickly through these slides, um, are some of the um, 80 by 2018 efforts. Um, we did join the um, 80 by 2018 movement in, in 2014, and it's actually a big win of our state cancer coalition. Um, for our current um, cancer plan that's still in um, review, um, our, um, you can see our goal here for colorectal cancer screening is to increase it from uh, 60, around 64% to 80%, and this was 2013 versus data when this, um, this objective was developed. Um, and then in 2015, as Caleb mentioned in the beginning, um, we were one of the states that was selected to participate in receiving some additional training on how to increase colorectal cancer screening rates um, through partnerships with FQHCs. And so that partnership actually um, resulted in us um, developing an action plan to assist community health centers to increase their colorectal cancer screening rates. And we wanted to develop a CME training that addressed the specific needs and challenges of community health centers. And so we didn't want this to be just, you know, another training because there are a lot of resources out there. Um, we wanted it to really um, hone in to those specific challenges that California FQHCs were experiencing. So we actually um, uh, conducted a needs assessment um, first. Um, so for, uh, um, in this process, we established our colorectal cancer work group. So you heard me say in the beginning that CDOC established a, a colorectal implementation team. Well, once the implementation team kind of morphed into C4, there was, you know, we found no need for a work group um, or an implementation team. So we didn't have any specific work group working specifically on colorectal cancer because we always deferred to C4 since they were still a part of our coalition. But in order for us to develop this specific um, CME, we decided to convene um, another work group to work specifically on this issue. 
um, and you'll see some of our um, partners there. One of our main partners was the California Primary Care Association that really helped drive this effort forward. And you'll see that we utilized um, the STEPS guide, the ACS STEPS guide, um, to develop our needs assessment, which eventually developed our training um, curriculum. And um, this is just kind of a snapshot of um, the training. It was 4.25 CME credits. And we do have those uh, videos available now on cpca.org. And just a quick snapshot of the training curriculum. Based on the needs assessment and um, following that steps guide, um, we went over the topics of operational efficiencies, care delivery and coordination, and best practices for financial sustainability. Um, and just to kind of wrap up, just to say, you know, collaboration is key. Um, it, you know, increasing colorectal cancer screening rates, you know, it requires collaboration, but also that commitment and the passion that I mentioned. Um, you know, the again, I can't say it enough how much um, the C4 here in California works um, to um, not only just increase the screening rates, there are so many um, other things that they're working on. They Because they're a separate 501c3, they can work on um, different um, policy issues and things like that. So um, it, it really is uh, well-rounded um, in terms of what they're working on. So just some lessons learned. Um, again, ensure there's a champion on board. That's, that's really, really important um, for these efforts. Um, as I mentioned, make sure you utilize your state cancer coalition. Um, and you'll find, if, if you haven't had contact with your comp cancer program, that they're, that they're usually going to be willing um, to work with you on this. I mean, that's what we do in comp cancer. We, um, we, we reach out and we network form these collaborations so we can move our efforts forward. Everyone has the same goal in mind, so make sure you reach out to your comp cancer program. Engage your stakeholders and build your network and ensure there's diversity in membership. As um, Caleb was talking about in the guide, that's another step. Um, there's several um, uh, different types of stake stakeholders that are a part of C4, and there's some there you can see on the slide. Develop a vision and goals um, as, as part of the guide as well. Get creative with funding efforts, and that's another thing that C4 does. Um, in addition to, you know, participating in the undie run walks, um, which is, you know, a fundraiser where people run in their underwear to bring that awareness to colorectal cancer, they've organized, you know, golf tournaments and things like that. So you can get creative with, um, fun, with fundraising. Utilize your existing resources. Again, there's going to be some uh, a comp cancer program that's working on some efforts or that may have some connection, so make sure that you utilize that and, and tap into that. And then maintain your stakeholder commitment. Um, that's important as well um, for everyone to stay engaged um, with all of these efforts to move them forward. And that's my time, and um, I'm going to pass it back over um, to Caleb. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both so much. It was just um, really quite fantastic. I, I learn something every time I hear the two of you talk. So um, what, what we're going to do now is take some time for questions. Uh, we have about 10 minutes or so, uh, just about to the top of the hour. So if um, if you all have a question, please do use the, uh, the Q&A uh, box within the, the webinar platform here. And uh, we'll, we'll take them as they, they come in. Um, one one thing that you know I kind of want to start out with, and I don't think is addressed with the guide too specifically, because you know we're trying to get you know, what it takes to get things started, what it takes to keep things going. Um, but both of you have such, both of your states have such a long history of you know working on this topic, and I'm sure there's ebbs and flows of good times and bad times. And Katie, I think you got into it a little bit, so. I think maybe it might be a little bit reassuring to the group too, especially if they're just starting um, with um, with their efforts um, to talk about how to get through those times, and and then also you know that that this work is, is sometimes uh, a little bit 
grueling and gradual in the, in the way the process comes. And then sometimes opportunities come where you have a fundraiser come to you or, or uh, somebody, a really, a, a really great champion that can really mm-hmm. kick things off and get things moving. So yeah. um, I'll just leave it there. Yeah, I was thinking that, um, Caleb, when I was listening to Shantae and thinking about um, what I shared, it's always, it's hard if you are on the front end to listen to some success stories and think, well, we don't have that champion or we don't um, have that leadership here in our state. And so I think because that is so key, and both Shantae you can share um, as well, but because that is so key, I'll just give you some ideas. If you do not have that kind of champion to get you going and you feel stuck, what I would suggest doing is putting together a really good presentation, very short, but one that has um, the data, the burden of the data for colon cancer in your state, and um, take that presentation, and, and if you're the comp cancer person or a colon cancer staff, whoever um, is willing to take it and, and give it at places like your medical association. You know, Kentucky has a the Kentucky Medical Association, the Kentucky Hospital Association, um, even like a junior league, if you're looking for some private um, leaders in the private sector, uh, a, a junior league or some sort of Lions Club, Kiwanis Club, that's kind of the hard work of trying to find those leaders, but I, I can almost guarantee you that if you if you put yourself in some forums, their leaders will, will bubble to the top. And it, it is hard work, but once you find people that are committed, it's so encouraging and it really does catalyze things moving forward. Shantae, do you have any advice about that? Yeah, I, w- I would totally agree with you, Katie. Uh, Shantae, um, hang on, uh, Shantae, sorry to interrupt. Um, just sure. real quick, if any, if I just want to make sure that I did mention that um, if there are questions, please do use the Q&A box because um, within this webinar, we don't have an opportunity to have people uh, voice uh, their questions. So please do sure. use the chat box or the Q&A box. Okay, sorry, go ahead, Shantae. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that I agree with Katie in, in terms of, you know, going out and, you know, making your case, giving um, your presentation to different groups um, because I find that um, we, we're always getting new people on board um, with us um, when we do that. So, um, yeah, I would totally agree. So we do have um, one question here. Um, and I'm going to hijack it just a little bit um, to maybe broaden it, but I'm specifically asking about how to, uh, you know, if we really do have interventions that we want to get funding for or specific, um, you know, activities that we want to get funding for, the, the best way to to do this, um, and specifically this question is towards um, DNA tests, DNA testing and the applicability of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that, you know, the, the – the the rise of the non-invasive stool testing has really been a game changer um, for just the whole colorectal cancer community over the past five to ten years. And I think if I were an FQHC and with limited resources, um, specifically in patient navigation, doing some sort of awareness um, education with your providers about fit testing to promote fit testing with your entire office staff on board from the moment a patient walks through the door um, until they leave your your facility, that making sure somebody's asking them about whether they're up to date on their screening, and it, if so, uh, would they be willing to make an appointment for a stool test or to take home a stool test that they could do themselves in the privacy of their own home uh, has has been really helpful here. And there are several best practices on how to get, um, how to accomplish that. And I would encourage you to go to the nccrt.org website to, to look for those. But I, I saw in the chat room about, you know, five things. And I would say that the FIT education campaign would be really key with providers. And I will tell you, don't be discouraged. Um, sometimes if you build it, they don't always come at first. We thought that if we made FIT tests available, available to a certain facility that certainly the doctors would be referring them out the door, you know, 24-7, and and that simply wasn't the case. We need to do a lot more education with the providers themselves who are so used to colonoscopy in this area of the country that um, to, to get the providers on board. So that that's just something that comes to mind. What about you, Shantae? Yeah, you know, um, yeah, I would definitely um, direct people to the NCCRT website. Um, as I mentioned in um, my talk, you know, with um, um, 
with uh, with creating our um, CME, we referred um, to that steps guide, and it gives you that step by step. And I will say that here in California, um, you know, a lot of the um, community grants that were handed out um, to our clinic to the clinics here, um, they were working primarily with fit tests. So that you know, there was no um, colonoscopy involved. They did have to have um, a safety net um, in place um, for those positive fits that were identified or they would couldn't be funded. Um, but that was, you know, the main um, the, the main sort of uh, way that uh, the the projects um, were going in, in terms of increasing the the screening in clinics, and I will also say that that provider education is also that important piece because just because you know this is the the route that you're going to take doesn't mean that um, you know like you said everyone's going to come. And I think also um, ensuring, and, and what's in the steps guide is, is talking about building your team and um, making sure you have your team um, within your um, clinic um, to be on board because it's not always the provider's responsibility. Um, you know, that responsibility of uh, just um, giving out the fit, doing the, the patient reminders, the um, you know, the follow-ups can be shared amongst staff. So a lot of the FQHCs that we've seen have sort of sparsed um, all of those responsibilities out. And, you know, it, it truly functions as a team effort in terms of getting um, folks screened in, in the FQHCs. Um, I, I do have uh, just kind of one more question that might be able to kind of wrap us up here. You know, each, each of you can take 60 to 90 seconds to kind of think about this. I think one of the things that we have with coalitions we all start from very different places, whether we're trying to do it locally or, or at a state level. Um, and sometimes we're lucky and sometimes we're not so lucky about how quickly we can get those things off the ground. Um, and sometimes we hear really great things from other states that are inspiring. You know, that there's a lot of great things from this toolkit that I think are applicable across many states. Uh, and I think a lot of things that you guys have presented here could be, you know, could be replicated. Uh, but obviously there's sometimes there's, there's particular opportunities that do come up. Um, so I guess is there something inspiring that we might we might tell our audience today that helps them, you know, take the first steps of getting things getting things started and knowing that um, uh, we we can you can do it in your state, but you know it's not just it's not just able to do it in California, we can yeah. do it in other states as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I hear that. We, you know, like I said in the beginning, we were almost dead last in the country. And I would attribute a couple things to it. I uh, the, the coalition and again the slogging through of the meeting consistently um, but one thing I will tell people today is there is so there are so many good resources to help you in your work you're not alone there's people like Shantae and myself that are more than willing we're, we're, we're geeks about this we love to talk about it so feel free to get in touch with us um, to, to even just talk to your coalition about giving you some ideas of how to move forward and there's so many great resources which the NCCRT has done the hard work of compiling on their website if you would even just like block out a couple hours of an afternoon on your calendar and sometimes I have to just make that time to look through the website website and, and see if there's something that somebody's already done that you can beg, borrow, and steal for your state or for your clinic. Um, there's a lot of great examples out there that are already tested that work well. So that would be my two cents. Yeah, and I would echo that as well, like exactly what Katie said, because there are so many people um, across the country that are working on this effort and that are happy to share what they've done. I mean, I have found that um, just in presenting some of our work and just um, continuing some of our efforts and starting some new efforts, there's always something new to learn and people are always willing to help. So even though resources are limited, the one thing that you know, we all have in common is that we we have the same goal. So people, you know, are out there to help you. The organizations have those best practices. And if one doesn't fit, there's going to be another one out there or someone's going to have that resource to be able to connect you to. So definitely do um, your homework and, and refer to all of the many tools that are that are out there. Um, well, thanks, and I, I think we're, we're running up against time, so um, for the questions that we didn't get to, I, uh, we will follow up with uh, and uh, get back to you on those. Um, I do want to 
just again thank our presenters uh, for all the the time they've given to present to us, and it's always nice to hear from from states about the excellent work that's being done. Um, and then we also want to thank CDC for providing the funding uh, to make today's webinar possible. Uh, we encourage you to visit nccrt.org and connect with us on social media to find information about upcoming roundtable webinars and other news. Uh, and you can see the information here on the slide that we have up. Um, and then for more information on today's webinar, please feel free to email nccrt at cancer.org. Um, and I thank you all for joining us, and um, I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, Caleb.